presence. We delight in the fact that you are our God and we are your people, the sheep of your hand. And Lord, we're here to eat out of your hand, to be fed with the word of God, to be fed with truth and life and blessing and increase and all of these things we receive because of your word. So, Lord, we're here to give you honor and praise, and I thank you for each of these that you've brought to Bible study this morning. I thank you for those that may listen to this message um, by way of the Internet. Lord, we pray for all of our families and all of our loved ones, and Linda specifically asked that we hold up her mother in prayer this morning. Father, we just pray for her mother as she's in the hospital, and, and we just speak comfort and strength to her body. And, Lord, as... as She's even preparing to, to move to heaven. Lord, we just thank you for a peaceful transition. Lord, it is Linda's desire that her mother not suffer, but Lord, that as she um, transitions into your hand, we just thank you, O oh God, that you receive her, Father, and that there's a great cloud of witnesses waiting for her mom as we celebrate the, the life that her mom has lived. And we just pray that whatever time she has here this side of heaven, Lord, that she... Uh, be strong enough to fellowship with her family and to, to be in, in comfort, Father. And we just lift all of our family and loved ones up to you and speak health and blessing to all of our bodies. And we just plead the blood of Jesus over our time together. And we thank you, Father, that we have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying because we know that we are in prophetic times. We are in times, Lord, when you're moving and you're accomplishing things in this earth. So, Lord, we stand in agreement with your will, and we declare not our will, but yours be done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Glory to God. Well, of course, last time uh, we were together, we talked a lot about uh, the upcoming election, and we're going to continue to pray and stand for these United States of America. And we continue to remind ourselves that as God's people, we have been given authority over this earth, over particularly these United States of America that we live in. This is our land. This is the land that God has given us. And so we've been studying the book of Revelation, and we've been um, going through the first four chapters of this book. And, of course, Revelation being the final book of the Bible, um, I was reading and I wrote down for myself, because what we do is when we look at Revelation, we go into the book of the prophets and we see how everything really fits together. Because God didn't just lay out in one storyline that we could kind of read straight through and we can figure everything out. He gave different things, different visions to the prophets of old. He gave uh, different revelations to the apostles in the New Testament. And so we look at all of those, and when we read them and understand them as a corporate word of God to us and how it's revealed, um, I like the phrase that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So in other words, in the Old Testament, they lived out the natural application of things. And of course, um, through the pr uh, prophetic writings of the prophets in the Old Testament, they foreshadowed and foretold what would ha be happening in the New Testament. So the in the Old Testament, the, the picture of the New Testament is concealed. You have to dig around in the Old Testament to understand what the New Testament is going to be. But when you get into the New Testament, it starts opening up all the things that the Old Testament prophecies revealed. So we really need to, s to study them hand in hand and tandem one with another so that we can get a picture of where we're at. You think about how blessed we are to live in the time of the end because now we can see not only all the prophecies that have already been fulfilled, but we can understand the Old Testament and the New Testament and how it all fits together and realize we're at the very brink of all the final prophecies being fulfilled. So think of that blessing. Think of the Old Testament and, and you know, the, um, the prophets of old. It said they looked afar off and they saw the, the Redeemer. They saw Jesus, but they could only see him afar off. They didn't have the privilege of having 
that born again experience where the Savior was going to live in them and have those things revealed. And so they're very jealous of us, of being able to live in this time. And we think, oh, wouldn't it have been wonderful to live in the times to see those things happen. So, you know, we as a people, that's our human nature to always want to experience what other people did. But praise God, we're in very prophetic times and we're going to be the ones when the, you know, when we see Paul, the apostle, and we see Daniel and we see Jonah, they're going to say, wow, what did you get to see at those end of times? What was it like when all of those things were were coming to pass? So we're going to be the ones that get to see that. And so we're going to um, start today by reading into um, Revelation chapter 5. And we're going to look at some interesting things. And I alluded to this, uh, of course, last week we interjected with with things that um, I heard from the conference, the prayer conference, some of the things that were being done prophetically, things about the election. And we didn't record last week because I wanted to be able to, to talk about what uh, Brother Copeland brought to us in terms of the election and things that he was seeing uh, that he believed God had shared with him. But in light of that, of course, we're going to continue to believe God for this election. We're going to continue to believe God for what is right. And what is right is God's platform. We have to remember that w that the time that we're living in, we're not voting for a man or for a woman for this office. We're voting for a platform. And we, as God's people, are responsible for the platform of life, for the platform of liberty, for the platform of truth and justice. And so then we can see what candidates line up with those platforms, God's word. God's truth, and we need to vote accordingly. And it's not about voting Democrat or Republican. It's about voting for the person that most aptly represents God's platform. So again, we need to look above man and say, God, we're going to vote according to your word and to your truth. And if Christians all over these United States would do that instead of getting locked into a natural person or personality and arguing politics, we, the Christians, could control every single election because if we voted for the and prayed about the person that best represented God's word and God's truth. And because Christians um, are a majority, the still the majority of the population are from an uh, Christian or evangelical background. So we're going to pray and believe God that this nation continue to be one nation under God. I was at the Christian school earlier this morning uh, taking my grandchildren um, to school there. So I stayed for the Pledge of Allegiance and they stood and did the pledge to the American flag. They did the pledge to the Bible and they did the pledge to the Christian flag. And I thought, how refreshing that they, they uplift and honor God in this nation and God's word over this nation and the Bible as the foundational truth of this. So that's what we're going to continue to believe because, of course, the Antichrist that we've been studying out of the book of Revelation would like to take that right away from this nation. Think about it. This nation is the only nation in the world that is founded upon God's word. All the other nations have been founded, and they may have Christians, and they may have some ability for religious freedom, those nations that are more uh, of, a, of a democratic republic. But the United States of America is a nation that was founded under God. And when you th also when you think about it, because I have to acknowledge, I was ready to, to kind of give up on America and just say, well, the church is still here, and as long as the church is still here, we're going to pray. And then God kind of woke me up and again reminded me of, of all of the prayers and all of the things that this nation was founded upon, and we shouldn't just let the devil trick us out of it. That's what he did to Eve in the Garden of Eden. 
he, the devil, tricked Eve and Adam out of their right to the very garden that God had created for them and allowed them to live in, and he fellowshiped with them in that place. But Satan came and talked them out of it, and guess what happened? They all got thrown out of the garden. They got dispossessed of what God had created for them. So if God established this nation, and as long as the church is still here, do you think God would dispossess us of this land? That really doesn't make any sense. But yet, I was getting deceived and thinking, well, this United States must fall, and maybe we're going to be here, and maybe we've got to go through this time and live under this persecution. No, that God is not like that. He does not cause his, he doesn't ever cause us to regress or go backwards. He always causes us to move forward with blessing. So many Christians, I think, have we've all gotten to that place where we, we look around and say, oh my gosh, what has happened to these United States? Well, God's going to take care of us and we'll just come over here and you know, s stay in our little corner. No, we need to be bold and to pray. And this is our opportunity, church, to pray for this election and to declare God's will be done. God shall promote righteousness. And he needs the people to believe him for it. So I'm standing believing God for this election, that it shall go the right way. We shall have a person in office that has declared that this person will uphold Christian values and will uphold religious freedoms and religious rights and will promote life, life in the womb and the right to protect life and the right of that child to have a life as it has been created. So that's what we need to stand for, church. So be in prayer these next several days because this nation is at a turning point and I believe God is going to not talk to the heathen about if they win the election or do this. He's going to talk to his people, the church. Why did you let my nation go? So we're going to be responsible to God, and we're going to watch God's will be revealed in these times. We're going to watch supernatural things, and that is the word of my testimony, and I know many of your testimony that is it shall go God's way and we're standing and promoting that. So as we get into Revelation chapter 5, of course we've come through the study of the churches and where how the churches um, impacted what was going on in the lands and how God was, was correcting some churches and blessing some churches based on what they did and we need to learn from that. But then we got into Revelation chapter 4 where John was called up to heaven. He heard a trumpet and he saw a door open and he got called up and he got to see the throne room of heaven. And again, we believe that's a picture of the church being raptured out. And so that's what we're waiting for is that rapture. But we need to make sure that things stay in order here while we're here. Because remember, our God tells us to what? Maintain and occupy. And he tells us while we're here, we're to rule and to reign. He never tells us that there comes a point where our ruling and reigning stops. No, we're to rule and reign while we're here, this side of heaven, and then we are going to corporately get called up, and then the, the, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, is going to come upon all of those who would not adhere to his word, who would not obey his word. So this is the picture that we're at. So now in Revelation chapter 5, um, we, the church, are up in heaven at the marriage supper and lamb. And now things begin to start here in heaven in this period that's called the tribulation. I don't believe we'll go through any because the seals aren't opened until they're caught up. Revelation chapter 4 is when John got caught up to heaven. And now he's up in the throne room of God. And then he begins to see all the scenes down on earth. So I believe that's a picture of the pre-tribulation rapture. Um, a lot of people try to make the case for a mid-trib or a post-trib or a no-trib, and I don't see it. Again, every good parent, if there's something you can stop your children from going through, 
you're not going to have them go one step into trouble. You're going to, no, no, let's go over here. Let's be safe. Let's pull back. And I believe that's our father. It says if, if you're a good parent on earth, how much more so is your father in heaven a good parent to you? So our father wants to cover us under his wing. He wants to protect us. It says, is that going up? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So I believe God's going to supernaturally protect us and call us up before this happens. Overture? Yeah, that's right. There's so many scriptures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it says, pray that you may be counted worthy to escape. And he's looking for those who are standing, believing him, and will escape this. So I believe when Revelation chapter 5 starts and all these things begin to unfold, we, the church, are already gone. And the, and the charts that I gave you showed that event happening before all this. But Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. So John is now up in heaven, and he's viewing all these things. And he says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I, John, wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the spirit of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints." And it goes on to say, and they sung a new song. So we're going to study this a little bit of this scene in heaven. And I actually, in, in reading, um, I think I've told you I've read a lot out of this book, Tim LaHaye, who's recently passed on and moved uh, on to be with the Lord, Revelation Unveiled. I've studied this book for years, and I saw a portion out of this I, that I didn't really um, take time to study before, but it, it's in regarding this scroll. And again, how wonderful it is in the Old Testament that God concealed in the Old Testament things he's revealing. And remember in the book of Daniel that Daniel said that more knowledge will be revealed in the last days and we'll have more understanding. And I believe things are coming together and we're, we're having more revelation and we're seeing things in the word of God that maybe we've studied for a long time, but now we're getting to see it. So it, this chapter is talking about the seven sealed scroll. And it, I, I want to read some portions out of you, and it, it goes back to the prophet Jeremiah and some interesting things about how God redeems us and how God does everything, uh, a picture and, and a shadow in the natural, so that God can have the authority to intervene in the supernatural. In other words, when God gave, and we studied this extensively in one of our earlier Bible studies, when God gave... Um, set Adam and Eve up in the Garden of Eden and he said I give you authority I give this land to you you rule and reign over this and literally God set Adam in charge of everything over all the animals over all the the birds and so Adam was in control and Eve was his helper and then they were to populate the earth and to run the earth and everything was in perfect harmony and they didn't have to toil. They didn't have to pull weeds and all of that stuff, which we hate doing in our gardens today. But, of course, we know when Satan came in and tricked Adam, literally Adam gave up his authority. He gave up title deed. 
Have you ever heard of people that have been tricked out of their possession? Something's been signed over or an older person has been tricked by family to sign things over to one person or another um, and it was by trickery and then the person comes and aha I've got title deed now you no longer have claim to this I have claim and the court of law upholds that because it was legally transferred over out of one person's name into another person's name so Satan, by trickery, conned or, or deceived Adam out of the rights to this earth. And remember, we, we come to understand that Adam and Eve basically were given six days to rule over the land, which would have been 6,000 years. So Satan took that, and that lease now belongs to Satan for 6,000 years, but what happened at the end of that 6,000 years, Jesus said he was going to come back and he was going to redeem the land back to him. And he was going to then rule and reign for that 1,000 years. And then there was going to be the final judgment um, after that 1,000 years of rest that Jesus would be ruling and reigning. And then there would come the final judgment. So earth had a total of 7,000 years in this time that, that we know as this era or this this time frame and then of course the ages to come we don't know what's going to happen in the ages to come but we do know there's going to be ages to come and we're going to rule and reign with Christ over whatever it is however he sets up the ages to come but we're in this 7,000 year period age that we know we're coming to an end so keep that in mind because what we're going to see now is a picture of how God gave to the prophets of what this seven sealed scroll is. And, and I've, I've known this, but I didn't realize it in terms of until I, I read this about the prophet Jeremiah, um, how he presented it, and it was a picture. Do you remember the, pic the picture that we saw when Abraham was told to offer up his only son Isaac on uh, as a sacrifice? I remember Abraham took Isaac and actually was going to sacrifice him. And God told, told him, I will always provide a sacrifice. So Abraham prophetically said, my son and I will go up, but we're going to come back and we'll see you again. Even though Abraham knew he was going to have to offer up Isaac on that altar and actually raise the knife to him. And he didn't know if God was going to require him to go ahead and sacrifice his son and then raise him up, but he trusted God in that, in that picture. But that picture was an enactment of man offering up his son so that, Jesus, that God could come and legally offer his son. And because God had to legally have an entrance into the earth, otherwise God would be intervening. You know how much talk there is right now about um, someone inter intervening or interfering with this election and whether or not it's legal and you know they might even bring you know um, accusations and uh, uh, charges against uh, Comey for quote unquote interfering with this election because it hasn't been done before well think about Satan if God illegally interfered with man think how much accusation Satan would bring because the the opposition <laughs> is always yammering they do things illegally, but as soon as the righteous do something illegal, oh my gosh, they scream and yell and throw a fit. So God always does things legally. So what Abraham did with Isaac was a type and a shadow, a picture of God offering his son Jesus for the ransom. But by what he did in the natural, allowed God to then bring Jesus in and to offer him. It was a legal precedent that was set because in the court of law everything has to go by legal precedent and rulings so that allowed God to offer up his own son Jesus so what we're going to see about this seven sealed scroll and what it represents we're going to see how God sets things up so the scroll that we saw if we see um, Revelation going back to Revelation 5 a uh, verse 1, it says, I saw in the right hand of him 
that sat on the throne a book. And it says in this book, um, Tim LaHaye points out that there's three characteristics of this scroll. First, it was in the right hand of God. It was written on both sides and a third, and it was sealed shut by seven seals. This little seven-sealed book in the hand of one of one on the throne mentioned in Revelation chapter 5 contains the secret of the chapter that follows and is the key that opens the entire book of Revelation. There can be no question that this is a significant scroll as determined by the events that follow. So this, whatever's written on this scroll, holds the key to the rest of the book of tri Revelation, all of the tribulation, all of the things that are going to come to pass. Now keep in mind, where are we? We're up watching this, like John is up watching this. We're in heaven. We're not going to partake upon it. And it says, John saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. It's evident at the outset that this scroll is intensely related to the human race, for angelic beings are excluded from opening it. Instead, the angel is looking for a human being. We therefore conclude that the book has something to do with human beings and their relationship to the earth, the home of the human race. In spite of that fact, no redeemed person in heaven or earth or under the earth in hell is considered worthy to open the book. The importance of the book is seen in the fact that John weeps when it's discovered that no one was found who is worthy to open the scroll or look inside. It says, what would cause a spirit-filled man like John lifted into heaven to weep? These are not idle tears induced because John just cannot satisfy his curiosity. No, his tears have a deeper meaning. Now it goes back, we're going to look at the prophet Jeremiah. It says, the prophet Jeremiah warned Israel that if it did not repent of their sins and turn to God, they would go down into captivity for 70 years, and which we know that they did go into captivity for 70 years, and Daniel was one of the ones who was taken into that captivity. It says, because they refused to heed the warning of God, their judgment was imminent. Tho through the same prophet of judgment, God promised that they would go down into captivity for 70 years, but would one day return to the land. To prove to them that they would return, God told Jeremiah to do a strange thing. Now, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 32, and let's look at this, and then we're going to look at this concept here, and we can, we're can we going to see how it ties in and how God continually ties everything together. So let's go to Cher Jeremiah the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32. And we're going to read some things out of here. And we're going to jump in in verse 6 of Jeremiah, chapter 32. And Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in Anatoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. Now this right of redemption is a concept that Jewish people understand, but we, the church, don't particularly understand the depth of it. We understand right of redemption by legal contracts. <coughs> like I said, we, we understand that if we buy something, it becomes ours. If we buy a piece of land, we get a title deed, and that we're able to pass that on to our heirs through the process of a will, through the process of a trust, and that it's a legal document. But the Jews, um, s by their laws, it is a very complex process, but it was being prophesied about this piece of land that this uncle could come in and because of his right of redemption, he could buy it. It says, so Hanamiel in verse eight, mine uncle's son came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord and said unto me, buy my field, I pray thee, that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, 
for the right of inheritance is thine and the redemption is thine buy it for thyself then I knew that this was the word of the Lord and I bought the field of Haman Hanamiel my uncle's son that was in Anathoth and weighed him the money even 17 shekels of silver and I subscribed the evidence and sealed it and took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances so I took the evidence of the purchase both that which was sealed according to the law and custom and that which was open and I gave the evidence of the purchase unto Baruch the son of Neriah the son of Masiah in the sight of Hanamiel mine uncle's son and in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison and I charged Baruch before them saying thus saith the Lord of hosts the God of Israel take these evidences this evidence of purchase both which is sealed and this evidence which is open and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days for thus saith the Lord of hosts the God of Israel houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again what in this land now when I had delivered the evidence of the purchase into Baruch the son of Neriah I prayed unto the Lord saying Ah, Lord God behold thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power stretched out arm and there is nothing too hard for thee thou showest loving kindness unto thousands and recompense the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them the great the mighty God the Lord of hosts is his name great in counsel and mighty in work for thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the son of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of its doing which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt even unto this day and in Israel and among other men and has made thee a name as this day and has brought forth the people out of Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders with a strong hand a stretched down arm with great terror and has given them this land which thou didst swear to their fathers to give to them a land flowing with milk and honey and it goes on to say that they possess the land so we see this picture of, of Jeremiah selling this land. Now I'm going to continue reading because we're going to see then the significance of this. And when we're reading the prophets, we have to understand that there's some natural things going on, just as it described, naturally getting this land set over and the witnesses and paying the silver. But prophetically, then we begin to see the prophet come out that he talks about how God's delivering them, that how God's going to set them back in their land. God's going to give them all that he promised. So let's see what this, and, and we will turn, and this is what caused me to, to realize that I hadn't understood fully the significance of these scriptures. Now we read about how um, God told Jeremiah that he warned the people and he says, he went and he bought the land, just as we read out of Jeremiah chapter 32. And it says, the prophet instructed his secretary, Baruch, to place the sealed scroll in an earthen jar and preserving it for his heirs. It was placed with other papers, verifying the legal owners of the property. And it says, although Jeremiah never lived to see the day when Israel went back into the land, his legal heir one day went before the proper authorities and on the basis of his kinship to Jeremiah proved that he was worthy to open the jar and what was sealed up and to own the property again. So, so actually we're seeing what was written here in Jeremiah. We're seeing this same scene reenacted in heaven. We're seeing the scroll that was sealed up and the angel looking to see, all right, who has the right to open up this scroll because again God does everything legally God never just as happenstance says, oh yeah you over there come up open this no it's all legal according to authority because he knows that Satan is there to accuse anything that is not done exactly right that's what Satan does in our lives he tries to tell us aha you screwed up therefore I can come in and I can steal and I can kill and I can destroy I can do all these things because you screwed up what he doesn't know that we've been sealed we've been redeemed and only our father has the right to convict us or judge us of any sin or wrongdoing because we're sealed with the blood of Jesus we're sealed with his mark Satan cannot legally open us 
He cannot legally touch us. Oh, but if we say, go ahead, and we open ourselves up it, then he can cheat and go in illegally. And that's why we have to know our rights. We have to know that we are bought with a price, that we're no longer touchable by Satan. And when we enforce that, then he has to back off. But if we don't know it ignorantly, we're like that person who gets cheated out of our property, who gets cheated out of things because someone told us to sign something and we put our signature down and we didn't know all the ramifications of putting that signature down. That's what Satan does. So that's why we have to understand these things because when Satan comes, we say, no, you are not legally allowed to do this. Get back. And he has to because the angels of God are there to enforce what is right. So it says essentially, this is the scene we're seeing in heaven, for all intents and purposes, the seven sealed scroll is the title deed to the earth. I didn't realize that. So that scroll, when Adam was tricked out of it by Satan, Satan took over that 6,000-year lease that God had given to Adam and Eve. And so then Satan, that's why he's the prince of the air. He has authority in this natural realm over natural people. Where his authority stops is the born-again believers who have now been sealed with the mark of God we're no longer his. We've, we've been taken out of the possession of the earth, out of that realm, into God's possession, and we move supernaturally according to the deed and the word written in God's word. So that's why we can have authority, but we don't have authority over all of the demonic forces. It says, every place your foot shall tread, God has given you the land. We have certain authorities. We need to operate in those authorities, but we don't have the full title deed of the earth. Satan, for those 6,000 years, has that title deed. Now, when Jesus came and took the keys of sin and death, Jesus took back the authority, but there's still some legal things that need to be tied up. One of them is the full title deed of the earth in this scroll that Jesus is going to redeem when he gets fully done with this 6,000 year lease. And so at the time we're coming into Revelation chapter five, the church has been raptured out and Jesus is coming to, to repossess the full title deed of this earth and to open it and to loose all of the judgments for all of what has happened and what Satan has done in this time. So this title deed to the earth was given by God to Adam who lost it through sin to Satan. For that reason, Satan is in control of the world from the time of Adam until the glorious appearing of Christ. John weeps because he knows that this scroll represents the title deed of the earth that as long as it is left sealed, Satan will remain in control of the earth. Then one of the elders said unto me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, which this is quoting out of Revelation that we have read, it says, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and its elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. That's out of Revelation 5, verses 5 and 6. And then the commentary of this book goes on to say, and as John looks, he sees a lamb that appears as if it had been sacrificed already, possessing seven horns, seven eyes, and seven spirits. This gives us five characteristics of the Lord. Now it talks about this lamb, says he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. The names of our Lord are never given by accident, but all convey a part of his nature. Since the lion is the king of beasts, and since Judah is the ruling tribe of Israel, this indicates that Christ is to come as king and reign over human affairs. Number two, the root of David. This, of course, refers to Jesus' incarnation or his first birth with his roots in the family of David. 
Number three, a lamb looking as if it had been slain. When Christ completed the work of redemption, here's that word again, the redemption, and we're going to be talking about, again, Jeremiah's land and the redemptive um, covenant and the redemptive law. It says, he earned the title deed to the earth as by Adam came sin, so Christ came redemption. It's a beautiful picture that we see here. Even though the angel refers to our Lord in his glory as a lion, indicating his power and might, John sees him as a sacrificial, la sacrificial lamb. For John sees him through eyes of faith. Those who reject Christ will see him as a lion when he comes to judge and reign over them. Those who believe in him will see him as their sacrificial lamb. And he had seven horns. This indicates that the lamb is not weak. A horn in scripture indicates power. And it says, the Lord Jesus said of himself, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. When Christ came the first time as a lamb, though he displayed certain powers, he did not manifest all of his power. When he comes, as, comes the next time as a lion at his glorious appearing, it will be the manifestation of his omnipotent, all-consuming power. And the seven eyes are the seven spirits of God sent out in all the earth. The eyes speak of judgment of the Lord, including seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit that rests on him without measure. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 11, 2. We're going to take a look at this. And again, prophetically, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about Jesus coming. And we've often mentioned that the prophets of old didn't understand be the distinction between the, the Lamb of God and the Lion of God. So, you know, we in our natural thinking, we never want to do anything meekly. When we go in and we want power, we want to go in and rattle someone's cages and say, get out! I'm in control here. You know, have you, have you watched children play? You know, and how they rule over one another and they want to tell one another, I said to do this. No, I don't want to. Yes, you do. And whoever's the most powerful personality usually wins out. And so that's how we as human nature evaluate things. We want to always see things done in power and might. But God set up, and he was showing the prophets, and they, they, they maybe understood it, but the people that read it or, or the people, they didn't understand that Jesus was going to first come as a lamb, as a sacrificial lamb. He, he was going to have authority. He was going to have power. But he was going to offer himself for our sins. And so in order to do that, he had to appear in man's eyes to be weak and to allow himself to be crucified. It was only after the fact that did the devil realize he had been deceived. That when, s when Satan thought he was in control and he was going to crucify Jesus and kill him, Satan was like, see, I'm the big man here. I did this. Jesus knew all along that he was setting Satan up and that in that sacrifice, God was going to be able to manifest the redemption of, of man and what Satan had stolen. So it's kind of like a game of chess. And at the cross, Satan got checkmated and was set up so that God could, could get the full control, full authority back legally and redeem all of those that were hadn't, hadn't um, been to the cross before and all of those after Jesus, God could legally redeem his children back that wanted to be redeemed. But then, several thousand years later, Jesus was going to come as a lion in the authority, in the power of God, and he was going to do his final establishment of his rule and reign and be able to open this title deed and fully take everything back power. But how God set it all up was that all of this would be done legally and in order so that Satan could not stand before God and all of the angelic hosts and accuse God of doing something illegally. And that's why, you know, we see all through time that there's always this power struggle between those that are willing to do evil and those that want to do right. Those that are willing to do legal, uh, to do evil, will do anything. They don't care whether it's legal or illegal. They just do what they want to do. 
but the righteous must always do things legally and what's right because then they can't be accused in a court of law and and come under condemnation and thank god the blood of jesus is legal and removes condemnation and conviction not the convicting power of our hearts but takes the convicting power of satan away from satan so let's continue um, out of isaiah chapter 2 and look now what the prophet isaiah saw so it says in verse 1 uh, uh, sorry 11 um, isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 it says, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So what this is talking about is the descendants of Jesse, the genealogy, or the everything that's coming through that genetic lineage. And it says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This, and it's, again, now we know that this is talking about Jesus. Because out of Jesse comes David. Out of David comes Jesus in that genetic lineage. And so it's prophesying now about Jesus. And it says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, the fear of the Lord, and the Spirit of God, those seven spirits, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And it goes on to talk about, again, prophesying about the millennial reign when Jesus comes as the Lion of Judah and establishes that there's going to be righteousness restored to the earth, and, and the righteous king will, will rule with all um, truth and liberty and justice, and everyone shall live in peace. So we see that that as this book is being opened, that God is going to reclaim or redeem his right back to the earth he created. And it all starts with the opening of this scroll. So it says, when our Lord comes, he will know that all human beings, he will know what we've ever thought or what we've ever done. Every deed will be brought into judgment. Note that the seven is God's number of perfection. Therefore, when Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, comes to judge the world at the end of the tribulation, it will be as the perfect judge who has all power and who knows all things about humankind. It should also be borne in mind that he was the sacrificial lamb, but people rejected him. The unsaved rarely contemplate the one who will judge them in eternity is the very one they spurn by rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The moment Christ takes the seven-sealed scroll, all the angelic beings in heaven fall down before him, including the four living creatures and the 24 elders. Almost as a footnote, they are mentioned as having two things in their hands, harps indicating the music of heaven and the golden bowls filled with the prayers of the saints. Although it is impossible to be dogmatic about these prayers, one is almost led to believe that they are unanswered prayers that will be answered at the glorious appearing of Christ. This is interesting. Many a Christian has gone out into eternity with the prayer of the Apostle John. Come, Lord Jesus. Still unanswered, this prayer will be answered in that day. Many a Christian has prayed, as our Lord taught us to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This will not be accomplished until Christ comes to set up his millennial rule. This is another indication that all prayer is answered, though we may not receive the answer in our lifetime. So that's interesting to think that, because how many have all of us prayed, Oh Lord, come, come Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we know some things are happening that are not according to God's will. And, you know, there's nothing that we in the natural can do about it, but our prayer is still there. And that's the faithfulness of our God, that he 
literally will answer every prayer that's been prayed from the beginning of time till the time he takes us home. Every prayer shall be answered. And that's the righteous judge, that he's going to answer every prayer on the hearts of men. So we see this picture of this kinsman redeemer, and this should bring to mind also the story of, remember Ruth and Boaz? And we're going to see just a little bit. I, wa I want to tell you about this in the last few minutes that we have left to again see this picture of how everything that God says that's going to prophetically happen, he completed a natural work here so that he could do the supernatural work. And to see how deep this rite of redemption goes and how this little seal uh, representing the title deed of the earth is, is the exact legal picture of and the culmination of Jesus completing what he did on the cross. Yes, it was a finished work. But the fullness of what he did will not happen until he fully redeems every, not only person, but also all the land. Because remember, God has the land and the people to go together. God created the, er the heavens and the earth, and then he created man to live on it, and the land and the earth go together. And we see that in Israel. Um, in, in Hebrew, there's two words. There's Am Israel and Eretz Israel. Am Israel is the people, Eretz Israel is the land. So if you say Israel, we think of, you know, we kind of see the land, we can kind of see the configuration of the state, and we think of all the people that live there, but it's really two distinct things. There is the land of Israel, and then there's the people that God calls Israel to live in the land Israel, and he caused them to go together, and we know scriptures talk about the land and how the land rejoices when the people are in it and the land produces when the Jews lived in it. But when the Jews went into exile, the land fell apart. The land rested. It wouldn't produce anymore. And the land became a swamp land. The land became desolate. And other peoples that came into the land, they tried to get it to produce, but it wouldn't produce. Why? Because the right people weren't living in the right place. And that's why your land produces for you. When you are operating in God's authority and God's blessing, your land will work for you. Your land will bless you. That's how God set it up. And so when it's not producing and not blessing, we need to figure out, okay, Lord, what's what's not happening get in prayer get the wisdom of God take authority over the land and say all right land we're together now we're going to produce for the glory of God all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose what are all things all things your physical surroundings your spiritual surroundings everything is supposed to work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So when things aren't working, it's our part to go and say, okay, God, why isn't this working? I'm doing that on behalf of this church because all things are not working together as they should. There's opposition. There's people being taken out of church that shouldn't be taken out of church. There's people that need to be in church that are not in church. And I'm seeing this more and more, and I'm saying, okay, God, there's some principalities, there's some powers, there's some rulers in, in places that are opposing, that I'm not addressing, that I'm not taking authority, and that's stopping because I have authority. We have authority. Remember that song, this land is my land, this land is your land. From What is the rest of it? From... California to the New York Island and it goes on to talk about that this land is ours and we need to rule and reign in this land and uh, I'm seeing how all of these things are fitting together and how they're all principles and precepts and concepts of God's laid out in his word and I believe we like John 
in these last times are given being given this revelation so that we can rule and reign so that we can open up the ability of God to move and to manifest in might and power in demonstration in these days because he has some things he needs us to accomplish that's why the United States of America is a land that belongs to the people to the citizens and as citizens of heaven and the United States of America this land is our land this land doesn't belong to the heathen it doesn't belong to the unsaved the unsaved did not purchase and redeem this land it was the saved that that redeemed this land that created this land they came to have authority and freedom to worship God when they came who did they commit this land to God the Native Americans who did the Native Americans worship and establish as their God God they may be they, I think they called him by their native tongue but they worshiped the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob not a false God yes some of the Indians got some things out of order but God had this land for a people that were his so I don't think we're gonna get to the fullness of Ruth and Boaz because I want to develop more this right of redemption because not only do I want you to see it about what's happening in terms of revelation and the seven scroll and what that means but I also want you to understand it spiritually and naturally for your rights for what you can redeem and what you can have in terms of the promises of God because again remember that when God deals with the Jews the nations and the church the church he deals with corporately but he also deals with individually and we need to understand our I individual rights as well as our corporate rights so that we can rule and reign individually in our families in our households but we can also rule and reign as the church of God and even as a local church so you know I'm seeing this so much clearer about all of these things and I'm recently and I'll talk more about this at a later time I'm recent I'm now reading um, a book you know I talked to you last week about the believers authority and I'm going to order those books but um, I got a hold of a book called operating in the courts of heaven granting God the legal right to fulfill his promises and how how we as Christians as joint heirs like Jeremiah and we're gonna we'll talk more we'll get back to Jeremiah we're gonna talk about Ruth and Boaz because we're just starting this picture how they put their land in to redeem and even though Jeremiah didn't see the redemption of the land his heirs came back 70 years later after they came back out of captivity back into the land and they went and showed the deed and said okay this is my land uh, you know I'm picking up where he left off and we need to do that in this book operating in the courts of heaven how we need to legally operate within the promises of God and how Satan has to has to obey because what we've been doing is um, how many of you have been in involved in any sort of court case or your family member has involved where they've actually had to go to court for something and if you've ever ever done that you understand that everything has to be done legally it has to be done the right way the right papers have to be signed they have to be submitted there has to be the right amount of time blah 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 and if they don't if something isn't done right they can throw the case out and say I won't even hear it or come back months later when you've got it all right and it and it's like well but I I should have the right to do this well in the court of law you don't and out you go even though it doesn't make any sense and it doesn't seem right and that's what's happening to Christians Christians are being thrown out of the courtroom because we even though the promise is ours God has said yes and then amen Satan can stop us he can put an injunction from us inheriting or getting the right to do it because we haven't done it according to the courtroom laws and so that's what I'm reading now is about how to operate in that and how to stop the devil from bringing 
a court order against us. And then because it's legal, Jesus backs off, the angels back off. And God's grace will sometimes pour in and, and overcome it. But we can have the legal victory every time if we operate according to the legal rights of the covenant. Because God's already made it happen for us. So I believe these are keys God is giving us, just like it's time to open the scroll. I believe it's time to operate in these principles and these procedures because this is how we're going to unlock the power of God to operate on our behalf. Amen? Amen. I don't know why this didn't work today very well. Taped and hold or something. But does anyone have any questions about any of this? Our right of redemption and the seven seals and where we're at. Any questions or any comments? Overture? Yes. Yes. That's right. Yes. Yes, he Jesus is our defense attorney. That's right. That's right. We overcome. We overcome these things. Have you ever seen a police officer go in to arrest someone who they know did a crime and they get in the court of law? And because the, if the officer didn't read them their Miranda rights, they can throw the whole thing out, even though the thief was caught stealing or killing, or it doesn't matter if, if there's a technicality. And I believe God is honing us in now on some of these technicalities so that the devil can't weasel out and steal, kill, and destroy from God's children. And so that's, I believe, the, the place that we're at now is God's showing us some things so that we can take greater authority. We've, we have the authority and the power. It's already been granted to us. We just haven't learned how to use it. And in many cases, it's been sloppy agape. And Satan's weaseling out, like I said. Overture? Very short. That's right. But we're victorious. That's right. And know his word. Yes. Well, I'm believing for a peop peoples to get a hold of this, and we're going to keep teaching it and preaching it and talking about all these things so that we are the ones that are in the know. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're revealing and showing us. And, Lord, uh, we understand who we are in Christ Jesus. We're studying in Christ I am. And, Lord, as we continue to unfold the book of Revelation and see the things that you are bringing to pass. We rejoice, O oh God, because we know our redemption is drawing nigh. It's close. It's even at the door. Even as John looked up and saw the door in heaven open, Lord, we're looking up and seeing that the door is being opened unto us, and you are soon ready to call us home. But, Lord, until then, we continue to do our part, and we thank you for the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. And again, we pray over all of us and speak life and health and protection and blessings to all of our bodies, to all of our family, and we thank you for salvation in our lives. And we give you thanksgiving in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, again, thank you so much for coming.
and being a part of our Bible study.